So what have I learned from this experiment that I would like to tell the world? Foremost, I've come to think that romantic love is a drive, a basic mating drive, not the sex drive. The sex drive gets you out there looking for a whole range of partners. Romantic love enables you to focus your mating energy on just one at a time, conserve your mating energy, and start the mating process with a single individual. I think of all of the poetry that I've read about romantic love, what sums it up best is something that is said by Plato. Um, over 2,000 years ago, he said, the God of love lives in the state of need. It is a need. It is an urge. It is a homeostatic imbalance. Like hunger and thirst, it's almost impossible to stamp out. I've also come to believe that romantic love is an addiction, a perfectly wonderful addiction when it's going well, and a perfectly horrible addiction when it's going poorly. And indeed, it has all of the characteristics of an addiction. You focus on the person, you obsessively think about them, you crave them, you distort reality, your willingness to take enormous risks to win this person. And it's got the three main characteristics of addiction. Tolerance, you need to see them more and more and more. Uh, uh, withdrawals, and last but not relapse. I've got a girlfriend who is just getting over a, a, a terrible love affair. It's been about eight months. She's beginning to feel better. And she was driving along in her car the other day, and suddenly she heard a song on the car radio that reminded her of this man. And she not only did the in instant craving come back, but she had to pull over the road from the side of the road and cry. So one thing I would like the medical community and the legal community and even the college community to see if they can understand that indeed romantic love is one of the most addictive substances on earth. I would also like to tell the world that animals love. There's not an animal on this planet that'll copulate with anything that comes along. Too old, too young, too scruffy, too stupid, and they won't do it. Unless you're stuck in a laboratory cage, uh, you know, and you're, if you spend your entire life in a little box, you're not going to be uh, as picky about who you have sex with. But uh, I've looked in a hundred species, and everywhere in the wild, uh, animals have favorites. As a matter of fact, ethologists know this. There's over eight, eight words for uh, what they call animal favorites favoritism, uh, selective proceptivity, uh, mate choice, female choice, sexual choice. And indeed, there are now three um, academic articles in which they've looked at um, this attraction, which may only last for a second, but it's a definite attraction, uh, and this, either the same brain region, this reward system, or the chemicals of that reward system are involved. In fact, I think animal attraction can be instant. You can see an ele elephant instantly go for another elephant, and I think that this is really the origin origins of what you and I call love at first sight. People have often asked me whether what I know about love has spoiled it for me. And I just simply say hardly. Uh, you can know every single ingredient in a piece of chocolate cake and then when you sit down and eat that cake, uh, uh, you can still feel that joy. And certainly I make all the same mistakes everybody else does too. But it's really um, deepened my um, understanding and, and compassion, really, for all human life. As a matter of fact, in New York, uh, I often catch myself looking in baby carriages and feeling a little sorry for the, for the tot. And, um, in fact, sometimes I feel a little sorry for the chicken on my dinner plate uh, uh, when I think of um, how intense this uh, brain system is. Our newest experiment is... Um, um, been hatched by um, my colleague Art Aaron, putting people who are reporting that they are still in love in a long-term relationship into the functional MRI. We've put the five people in so far, and indeed we found exactly the same thing. They're not lying. Uh, they basically, the brain, the, part, the brain areas associated with intense romantic love still become active 25 years later. There are still many questions to be uh, answered and asked about romantic love. The question that I'm working on right this minute, and I'm only going to say it for a second and then end, is why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? The reason I never would have even thought to think of this, but Match.com, the internet dating site, came to me three years ago and asked me that question. And I said, I don't know. I know what happens in the brain when you do become in love, but I don't know why you fall in love with one person rather than another. 
And so I've spent the last three years on this. And uh, there's many reasons that you fall in love with one person rather than another that psychologists can tell you. And we tend to fall in love with somebody from the same socioeconomic background, the same general level of intelligence, the same general level of good looks, the same religious values. Your childhood certainly plays a role, but nobody knows how. And that's about it. That's all they know. No, they've never found the way two personalities fit together to make a good relationship. So it began to occur to me that maybe your biology pulls you towards some people rather than another. And I have concocted a questionnaire to see to what degree you express dopamine, serotonin, estrogen, and testosterone. I think we've evolved four very broad personality types associated with the ratios of these four chemicals in the brain. And on this dating site that I've created called chemistry.com, I, I, I ask you first, uh, a series of questions to see to what degree you express these chemicals and I'm watching who chooses who to love. And uh, 3.7 million people have taken the questionnaire in America, about 600,000 people have taken it in 33 other countries. I'm putting the data together now and at some point, a, there will always be magic to love, but um, I think I will come closer to understanding why it is you can walk into a room and everybody is from your background, your same general level of intelligence, your same general level of good looks, and you don't feel pulled towards all of them. I think there's biology to that. I think we're going to end up in the next few years to understand all kinds of brain mechanisms that pull us to one person rather than another. So I will close with this. Oh, these are my older people. Um, Faulkner once said, the past is not dead. It's not even the past. Indeed, we carry a lot of luggage from our yesteryear in the human brain. And so there's one thing that makes me um, pursue my understanding of human nature. And this reminds me of it. Uh, these are two women. Uh, women tend to get intimacy differently than men do. Women get intimacy from face-to-face -face talking. We swivel towards each other, um, we do what we call the anchoring gaze, and we talk. This is intimacy to women. I think it comes from millions of years of holding that baby in front of your face, cajoling it, reprimanding it, educating it with words. Men tend to get intimacy from side by side doing. <laughs> as soon as one guy looks up, the other guy will look away. Uh, <laughs> I think it comes from millions of years of standing behind that uh, bush, sitting behind the bush, uh, looking straight ahead, uh, trying to hit that buffalo in the head with a rock. I think for millions of years, men faced their enemies. They sat side by side with friends. So my final statement is, love is in us. It's deeply embedded in the brain. Our challenge is to understand each other. Thank you.